You know, there were just so many things this week that quickened the pulse of Canadian politics, and almost all of them involved the Liberal caucus, the Liberal cabinet, and the Liberal leader. I'm a member of his cabinet. Obviously, we support him. Any minute spent on this garbage is a minute that's not spent on, on, on Pierre Polyev. Liberal Party is an institution in this country. It's bigger than one person, one leader. Is your Liberal caucus united behind you? Liberal Party is strong and united. It's, a, it's the decision of the leader of the party as to whether he stays on as leader. So that is Mr. Trudeau's decision. So are you planning on staying as Prime Minister past October 28th? Yes. I wouldn't call it delusional, but he's seeing something that, that I don't see that my constituents don't see. I think so I think we need to, to focus on, on Canadians. You think this is just going to go away? I think so, yeah. So has this push for Justin Trudeau to step down been pushed off? Or is there another chapter in this story coming next week? We have lots to talk about with our party insiders. Greg McEachern, he'll be quiet. He's a former <laughs> Liberal ministerial staffer. Fred Delory, he'll be buoyant. He is a former Conservative <laughs> campaign manager. And Melody Riche will tie it all together. She is the former <laughs> communications director uh, for the NDP. Um, I don't know where to begin. So, Greg, I'm going to let you decide where to begin. I don't know if you saw the clip from Wayne Long today. He did an interview with Rosie for Rosemary Barton Live on Sunday. and said he described what the prime minister did as flipping them off, mm. which doesn't sound like a happy thing. So we can begin with Mel. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I want to pull back a little bit on this. And I know that there's a lot of the um, conversation about uh, the dissidents, how many who signed the letter. Uh, what I do know, though, is that in the group that's named or numbered, um, they're not really named, there are more people than that group that are unhappy. That is true. Um, but what they're looking at and what they look to the, uh, we'll call, I guess we call them the dissidents, uh, for purposes of our coffee tonight, um, the dissidents, what was the plan following? Um, and that's where I think things kind of fell down for them. But that doesn't mean that everybody is, is super happy uh, in the Liberal caucus and what will happen um, following. Uh, I think that there are, are people that feel that um, there's not enough runway uh, for a leadership. Mm -hmm. And the phrase that kept being repeated to me over and over again uh, from members of parliament was it could be messy if they have a leadership. So what as opposed to this clean yeah. process yeah. they're going yeah. through right now. Well, or, or, okay, more mess, <laughs> greater mess. Um, so that's, that's part of it as well. I think the, the sobering fact that the supply and confidence deal doesn't exist does not give them um, the confidence that they could have a leadership. Right. Uh, you know, they could plan for one in, in, say, early 2025. So this is where we're at. But what I would suggest that the prime minister do is think about how he got in this situation. And that's when I say I want to pull back and take a look at this. Your caucus is so unhappy that this is where it's, it's gotten. Fred and I were talking earlier. We talked after the St. Paul's by-election. And the decision not to have a caucus meeting after that event might have been good politics and good comms at the time. It prevented, you know, your tribe from standing outside the door of a meeting room or yep. leaks from... from um, uh, you know, from a, a Zoom call. Um, but as Fred said at the time, this is their opportunity to come back with something else, another plan. And they, that, uh, that latter half didn't happen. Right. And, and I think that's been the, the big issue. Had they had that, because then when uh, they had the loss of LaSalle, that's when they really lost Quebec caucus. So the prime minister has to ask himself, mm -hmm. why did this get to this point? And, and I think the answer starts to get to a very, very small circle around him and the advice he's given. I, I heard from a Quebec, um, very strong Quebec liberal this week, where they said that they were curious about where the, 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 the prime minister's thinking was. Was he in his own echo chamber? And they felt when they saw the interview with Nathaniel Erskine Smith, they mm -hmm. thought that he was. And that's what really um, uh, upset them, scared them, whatever word you want to use. So, Fred, I remember you saying, uh, I think it was you said this summer, and, and I heard this from people close to the Prime Minister when the demand was for a summer caucus meeting after Toronto St. Paul's, that, oh, we don't want the media spectacle, as Greg outlined it. Everyone camped outside the door of a caucus meeting with leaks coming out. What did we get on Wednesday, right? We, we got that in the more primetime season with less runway to fix problems. What do you make of where things are? And do you think the, the dissidents, as, as I, I've dubbed them, can, can keep this going? Or are they done? Uh, I would, yeah, I'd almost call them rebels. They're, uh, cause they're, they're, 
they're not, they don't seem quite united. They don't seem to have any real leadership. They seem to be all over the place with what they're trying to do. Um, there's no focused attack here. Uh, they seem, a number of them seem quite committed to try to remove the Prime Minister as leader mm -hmm. of the party. Uh, but they're, again, there doesn't seem to, I'm not seeing much of a strategy. They're just doing weird tactics that seem to be failing. But back to, you know, the issue at hand where the reason why they're in this spot, obviously the polls and whatnot, but I think it's a lot of these people would be okay or at least committed to keep going the down this path with the Prime Minister if he had a plan, if he came back from the summer with a plan. And that's why I said after the by-elections in St. Paul's, don't have that caucus meeting, but sit down with your core team and come up with a focused plan and a strategy that you can sell to your team and tell your people that you're going to campaign on. This is our path to the next election. They have not done anything like that. It's still business as usual. The House has been bogged down for weeks with nothing happening, obviously with the Conservative motion on that. But there's nothing happening here, and the, the, Trudeau's team are not presenting anything. And that's what they, if they don't fix that, this could continue to fester. Mel, where do you think things are? I mean, some people revealed themselves as a Scooby-Doo moment, you know, uh, where they stood up and, and, and read out the letter, Patrick Weiler, and then others uh, sort of revealed where they stood on this issue. I mean, we're, we're, is, is it done? Does it, can it move ahead? Or do you think the Prime Minister has pushed it off and now they just deal with where they are? Right. Well, I think it's super interesting. When we had first started hearing either rumors or, you know, when, when you and other colleagues have broke the news about which MPs were the ones who were, you know, creating a lot of noise behind this. It kind of seemed like it was a lot of MPs in the Atlantic provinces, but what we've seen this last no, week is it's coast to coast, We're just the right? loud ones, they're just not the only ones. But, yeah, but you know what I mean? Yeah, what we yeah, saw yeah. this week was, actually, it's it's across the country. Yeah, Patrick so, Weiler's a Vancouver MP, Exactly, right? yeah. and and your, you know, your, your break earlier of who is the holder of the letter is a Quebec MP. So that, mm. to me, is bad news. It's not just one region that's having a hard time with the Prime Minister and who's being told by their um, constituents that the Prime Minister has to go. This is across the country, so how do you fix that? Um, and to the point earlier that you know, you maybe saved some time in the summer, you're now four months later, to your point, Folks are paying way more attention in October than they would have in July. Um, you haven't gotten your MPs on board. You've lost in Montreal. You've lost your campaign director. And you still don't have a message. You still don't know why you're running to be prime minister and you're not communicating that. So I don't know how you fix that publicly, but how you fix that with your MPs either. Um, and, and it's interesting. You know, we heard MP Drouin say, or he was asked the question, do you think this is just going to go away? And he said, yeah, I think it's just going to go away. And that just seems to be the, the strategy for the Liberals. If we just wait it out, things will get better. If we just wait, people will start listening to us and liking us again. And that, to me, just seems like such an entitled approach to not just what's happening internally, but to what people are feeling and, and the anxiety that people are feeling externally with, with this prime minister. So I, I want to ask you a question. When, when Earlier in the summer, we yeah. did a what to watch in the fall, and you talked yeah. about the supply and confidence agreement yeah. maybe going away, because it wasn't working for your party, yep. in your view, that yep. the NDP. I wonder if it also didn't work for the liberals mm -hmm. politically, in the mm -hmm. sense that, I don't mean in terms of polling and credit, mm -hmm. They, were, they got, bought them legislative peace, mm. but did it make them too politically comfortable mm. in that they weren't on the crisis footing, a minority government, they, they had COVID during the, sort of the first minority, and then they had supply and confidence in the second minority. Did mm. it make them kind of too comfortable and a little bit, I don't know if lazy is the right word, but lacking urgency? Maybe, maybe a little bit. And, and what I would say is, you know, if you look back to before the agreement, I kind of had that feeling a little bit before, and, and maybe that's because of the deal or the, the couplet, the comfortableness the, yeah. <laughs> the, of the deal, but but I also think other stuff and, you know, the pandemic and other, there was obviously world crises happening at the same time. It just always felt like, or it has felt like for years now, that the government is unable to anticipate anything, unable to anticipate the anger, unable to anticipate you know, that folks are having a hard time, unable to anticipate their own caucus feeling frustrated. And it just seems like no matter what, um, the government is unable to get ahead of anything and get their message out. And, and not only are they, you know, stuck reacting, they're not reacting very well mm -hmm. either. So, so I think that that's one of the big challenges. So, Greg, uh, you know, a lot of the, the people who signed the letter or support <laughs> the people who signed the letter, <clears throat> You know, they're, they're talking about scenarios that they fear of, like a demolition in the next election. They point to the Kathleen Wynne Liberals who did well in 2014 and then got wiped out in 2018, if I have my years correct. And, and they're worried about that kind of a scenario. And they're arguing, and people said this at the microphone in caucus, that our polling ceiling goes up if we change leader, and we do have enough time to do a leadership. Doug Ford replaced Patrick Brown. Kathleen Wynne replaced uh, Dalton McGuinty. 
national election, different thing, but there are, this is the argument that I get the sense is happening inside liberal circles. So what do you think happens next in all of this? Well, the counter to that argument has always been Kim Campbell versus Brian Mulroney. Of course, yeah. And yeah. the people, my friends who worked on the 93 campaign for the PCs, you know, I've asked them directly, do you think that if Brian Mulroney had, had ran, um, you know, would the results have been the same? They would have lost, but they would not have been reduced to two seats. That's always been the pushback. I think what people are waiting is some sort of rallying cry from the prime minister. I've been saying this since I watched his interview with you in June. Tell me why you want another term. Tell me what this is about. And if you don't know, sit down with some people outside your circle and say, this is how people perceive you the best. And we're going to, you know, we recommend you should run on this. But I think, you know, there's a lot of minor irritants that add up. I heard, you know, from one... Um, uh, you know, one caucus member, and we, we would we all know this when a leader visits or a cabinet minister visits. If you're going to someone's backyard, tell them. That still happens, I'm told, that ministers are in people's, you know, ridings and they don't know. Really? One of the other things that I heard um, was, and I have some personal experience with this, um, is stop bringing plans to caucus. Don't bring us another plan. And it's on advertising, it's on this, and then nothing ever happens. This is why people, I think, in caucus are very fed up. I was actually told, and I believe I've said on this show, yeah, ads are coming. I didn't make that up. I didn't pull that out of the air. Are Someone, you sure? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'll read the camera and say, we want to be after it here. So, you know, so that was something that, you know, I was safe to say, you know, I was told that, you know, watch for ads. I haven't seen them. So imagine if you're an elected person and your future is, is, um, is waiting on this. Yeah, and Fred, I had an MP say to me that plans either don't materialize or they fail in what they call ruby red ridings like Toronto St. Paul's and LaSalle Mart Verdun, which is, right. uh, that's a pretty damning analysis. Yeah, if they don't, uh, if, they're, if they're not putting forward the stuff and just telling the caucus that it's coming, uh, you're gonna continue to lose trust uh, on these issues. And this is where this festers, and now we have it boiling over with uh, this supposed letter, this, this letter of anonymous, mostly anonymous. Uh, MPs, uh, which is at the same time though, there's only 24 of them. Um, it, it, even if the Liberal Party had the Reform Act mm. in place, uh, where you could remove a leader, uh, they wouldn't have enough to meet the threshold to have a vote. Um, and then when you do sign that letter, it has to be public, so it, you have to be I, even braver. I do think it's dangerous just to concentrate on that number and think those are the only people that are that unhappy. There are people that are that unhappy, but just don't see that there is. There, that that the dissidents are giving them yeah. a path forward. Right. This so, is well, it, this is an interesting dynamic where the conservative right? is saying it's only 24 and the liberal saying it's actually large. <laughs> right. Sorry, go ahead. Well, that's interesting. Where there's no like there seems to be this rebel alliance has no uh, no leadership mm. in itself. There are all these individuals who are not coordinating together, and it, it kind of feels like the liberal government is so they're good it also of what to we're seeing. The, the reluctance, you know, like when this broke two weeks ago, I think we mm -hmm. were here. Um, you know, one of the things was they, you know, we kept, I kept hearing is that they wanted it to get to the PM before it got to the media. And they obviously this is true. failed. This is true. I, I mean, I, I don't know how the Toronto Star got it because we were on the air when Althea Ra's press published. Uh, published. I uh, could not disclose to you at the time, but I was working on what I had heard about the document, you know, which became the letter and the signature effort and all these sorts of things. But it's kind of this decentralized organic thing that almost has its roots, as I understand it, back at the London uh, Summer Caucus, where a lot of people got upset with the way things were going there, Greg, and, and they, I realized who kindred spirits were, and they all started, like, talking on the hopes of things. Toronto St. Paul became an accelerant, then the other things happened, and, and, and here we are today, right? So, like, that's kind of how it started. There's no central leadership. So, Mel, you have this 24. Mm -hmm. They haven't been revealed. Mm -hmm. There's some sense that when word of this got out, they were worried that loyalists were trying to infiltrate their ranks to find out exactly who was in it. And it, yeah. this is this is the cloak and dagger that's happening right, right, right. inside a government caucus yeah. that's won three elections. Totally. And, and what's interesting is, you know, we were talking earlier that this doesn't seem to have um, made an impact like maybe we thought it would leading up to it because it kind of feels like, okay, well, what happens next? But I think the only reason that that is, is what we're thinking is because they weren't more strategic or weren't more maybe organized in, in their efforts. And that's likely why other folks are joining them, right? Because why put your name to a letter if, if it's just going to be the same and then you piss everybody off that's going to be making the decisions um, at the end of the day and, and helping in the election. So uh, I can appreciate why folks are, are a little bit wary. And, and of course, what this does at the end of the day is it makes 
you know, listeners, it makes people at home trying to figure out who they're going to vote for in their next election think, oh, well, these people are a mess. They can't, yeah. they can't organize their own house. They can't clean up their own messes. Mm -hmm. What chance do they have to, you know, address the problems that I'm facing? Um, and I think some caucus members and cabinet ministers probably know that. They probably know that um, if this is chaotic and there's some um, uh, chaos, for lack of another word, yeah. um, inside their own caucus, folks at home will be even more likely to change a channel and to seek a different government. So that's probably what we're seeing too with that number versus other folks who are also upset. Well, this this kind of, this happened in New Brunswick with Blaine Higgs, right? They had a bunch of departures right. and a bunch of fights over policy direction and it hurt them. Yeah. Like, it, 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 like it cost them a seat, it yeah. cost them as a majority and it was definitely a distraction. So Greg, I wonder about this after, you know, it was George Chahal who wrote the letter uh, in June or July to asked for the caucus meeting after Toronto St. Paul's and got eight other people to sign it and it was rejected. So after making them wait mm -hmm. until now, a very emotional three hour meeting where he, the prime minister said, I will take, I, I, you have, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced I have to go, but I'm gonna reflect on this. 24 hours later, before lunch the next day, at a press conference on something unrelated, said, no, I'm staying and that's it and we're gonna find a way to do it. Does that help or hurt him in caucus, do you think? I think it hurts them. Yeah. I understand because there was a deadline and perhaps they're trying to show strength. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, again, I go back to you know, the prime minister should be asking how he got in this situation. Look, you know, I've done this with clients is when the mistake happens, you acknowledge and apologize if it's, um, you know, appropriate. Um, you commit, you know, the third part is to commit that it's not going to happen again. In the middle is you have to determine how it happened so you can prevent it from happening again. And what I'm nervous about is that there is not enough curiosity about why did this happen, the way it happened, when it happened, the prime minister was out of the country, all these things. There has to be some triggers for this. And part of it does go back to London, the caucus a year ago, where they, I think, certain things were promised, people led, were led to believe. But again, if you raise your own expectations, around let's say advertising and you don't meet them, you can't be surprised yeah. that the people who believed you, mm -hmm. who believe those expectations are gonna be somehow disappointed and they're gonna react. Yeah, and they're just bizarre incidents of caucus management throughout this. This was first reported by the Toronto Star, but I had it confirmed to me this week that one of the communication staffers in the Prime Minister's office, Fred, told the MPs, don't talk to reporters, they'll trade your identity in return for access. I mean, <laughs> I don't know a journalist in the world who would flip the name of a confidential backbench source to a cabinet minister or the PMO to get access. I mean, maybe some people do it. It's not how I've ever operated. It feels like a naive way to do things. And the political professionals in the caucus are like, what are you talking about, right? So like, that doesn't help. Yeah, the whole the way they've uh, they've handled this with uh, Mark Miller, his uh, very aggressive attacks against his own caucus mates, calling them uh, weak and titled. Um, I was I was stunned at some of the communications and the lines that he's used, and I don't think that's helped situation. Uh, he took it back a little bit by saying he admired the courage of the people who stood up, right? But he did some damage going into it. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it was garbage. Yeah, then garbage. the then the walk. Garbage after. process is what and he called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there was the walk. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Frank. Go ahead. No, it's just the the communications. One thing that I did find odd in all this too was the orc. We talk about the the rebels, or I have called them that, have not been organized. <laughs> yeah. The leadership hasn't been no, organized. Totally. There has not been counter punches very effectively, other than the prime minister coming out days later saying, "No, I'm staying. I'm good." Mm. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there was uh, Mary Ning was the first and only real minister, and then Mark with terrible communications came <laughs> out. But there was no big like 30, 40, 50, 60 Liberal MPs coming out and saying, "No, this is our person that we want leading us yeah. into the next election." That's noticeable. And you know, when you look at this and you look at all that's going on. Pierre Trudeau famously took a walk in the snow, and it feels like Justin Trudeau has his head in the sand. Mm. He's been rehearsing that one all week. Yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I think Mel, uh, you know, Fred's right. Like there was this silence in terms of in the early stages of this defending the prime minister, and Mary Ying happened to be on the plane when right. they stopped to refuel in Hawaii on the way back from Laos. Mm -hmm. um, but. It, it, the sense I have is they didn't really know what they were responding to because the reports of a letter, and nobody called me a liar or Althea a liar for, for reporting it, but they hadn't seen it, hadn't received it, didn't know what they were responding to, didn't know how big it was, and they wanted to talk about other things rather than unnamed, unknown MPs who may or may not do something, right? So I kind of understand that, but where do you think it is now from a communications response in all directions? I, I think it's hard um, 
for the Prime Minister to have a response without without the plan, without the here's why I'm running, here's what we're going to do. Um, and I think, again, that's to calm cabinet ministers, it's to calm caucus members, but it's also mm -hmm. to tell folks at home, you know, you don't need to be paying attention to this, here's what I'm, I'm talking about. You said earlier, you know, you were talking about the Prime Minister less than a day later had made a decision. You know, he reflected on it and made his decision. I think there's a difference between listening and hearing. And I think what we've seen from this Prime Minister is the inability to like internalize what people are saying to him and to fix the problems, whether it be communications problem in the way that they communicate their plans, the way that they communicate with caucus, um, but also just what they're talking about. And it's funny when we're talking about um, caucus management, uh, a few of the folks that I work with um, luckily, or I'm luckily, mm -hmm. lucky to work with them, they've worked in um, past uh, Prime Minister's office and talk often about different styles of caucus management. And the resounding thing that they say is this Prime Minister and this Prime Minister's office have no concept of what caucus management is. And I think we're really seeing that play out. So even despite the, you know, next day response of I'm staying, who's having the meetings with all the mm -hmm. folks that are upset? Who's having the meetings with with people who aren't upset, who aren't publicly upset, to make sure that folks are on side and realize that he is the path in the next election and to flip the channel because we're still talking about it and I think we're still going to be talking about it yeah. probably for a while. Yeah, depending on the reports you get, it's between 45 and 50 people spoke in caucus, which mm -hmm. is an extraordinary number uh, in, you know, in general session, as they call it. And a firm 20 said you got to go, got up to 30. Mm -hmm. Depending on how you where you stand on it, he's got to go, or we need serious change. Yeah. So the, the majority of people who spoke in there were pushing for something. So, Greg, just to bring give you the last word on this, um, he said what he said on Thursday that I'm staying. The minute a prime minister says something other than that, they're in a lot of trouble, yeah, totally, right? So, yeah. so there's nothing he can really say beyond that. On, on t you know, uh, at this point in it. My understanding of Justin Trudeau and my limited you know, time with him um, since I've been in Ottawa, he's, I, I, he's pretty fearless. He will stare things down. He is not afraid and he's very self-confident. And I don't say that as a criticism. Like he believes whether he's the best person to win the election against Polyev or to d get a soft landing for the party should they lose. At the center of it is the belief that he's the best person. So I take it that he is staying as of right now. Do you think there's any chance it changes between now and next week? Because once we get to the U.S. election and the cabinet shovel, it's hard to see any kind of a big pivot coming. My earlier comments about the reaction of, of those who want to see changes but don't think that the, you know, the, the bigger changes could happen in time before yeah. a, an election, I think that's probably the, the heaviest spot of gravity. Um, yeah, that's fair. You know, in 2019, I was contacted by... Uh, somebody from the inner circle when the, the SNC Lavalin, Jody Wilson, Ray Bolt thing was going on. And my big learning from that night was about caucus management. Mm -hmm. I want to pick up on, on your point. And it was not good. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, there's the Prime Minister's really good with the outside world. He's been a known figure his entire life, and he's got a very small inner circle. It's that middle space he has trouble with. In that middle space, in caucus, there are people that want to support him mm -hmm. if he wants to run again but they need a reason. Mm -hmm. I will support him. I just want to know that you want this and why you want this yeah. and what you're going to do. And I, and I hope that that's, if he's going to run again, that's the message he has to hear. The pe you don't have enough people around you right now to have this as a quality product, but there are people that are teetering on, on both sides of that fence. And if you want to pull them back over to your side, you damn well got to give them a reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, how do you do that? Fred, because it's interesting to look at the caucus discipline in the Polyev Conservatives, mm -hmm. which is extraordinary versus what's happening with the Liberals. And like my experience in covering provincial politics back home was when you're in opposition, the definition of victory is a collective one. And then when you're in government, the definition of victory becomes very individual. Right. right? <laughs> and so how do you, in the situation they are in, in the life cycle, give the caucus that clear sense of direction when you've been promising it and it hasn't, uh, hasn't appeared to their satisfaction at this point. It's very hard right now because have they been working on it? It takes time to, to map this out and they should have done this a year. They should have, they should have done this when Pierre Polyev became leader of the Conservative Party. That's when they should have like been, okay, here's your opponent in the next election. How are we contrasting with them? What is our goals and our vision and how do we match that up? It doesn't feel they've done any of that. They've been drifting to your point earlier about maybe they got too comfortable with the supply and confidence 
confidence. I think that is absolutely the case. They took their foot off the gas. It was like us, uh, Harper's Conservatives, when we were in our minority years, we were at our best politically. When we got a majority, we took our foot off the gas and we lost because of it. And that's where the Liberals are right now. Right now, he has to come out with something before Christmas, I think, saying this is what we're doing, this is who we are. But it's hard to write that now under threat. Uh, so it's going to get, I think, more choppy for them. It's interesting because when you go back to the 2019 election, Mel, um, they, they lose the majority and they immediately pivot to dealing with really provincial and mostly Western provincial alienation after the results of the election. They put Christian Freeland in the job of intergovernmental affairs minister to bring Scott Moe in and bring everybody in and try to repair things. And, and they seem to have a response to what they believe to be the political problem of the day. But then within a couple of months, Iran shut down a plane, the Wet'suwet'en were blocking the railway. And then we heard about this virus in China and everything just changed. Mm -hmm. And they went to crisis mode, responded well to it, but that was a operations of government, public confidence reassurance thing, rather than how do we keep this minority government alive with these changing circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. and, and at the time of COVID too, you had, which you almost never see, is almost all party support, right? It was mm -hmm. like, we're all going to get behind you on this and we're gonna make sure that people are taken care of because people need to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. so, so even in that, um, circumstance while, you know, I, I credit the, the government for, for managing the pandemic really well. Um, it wasn't like a, a strategic effort or, you know, a, an effort where they were communicating well or they were being, um, uh, this sounds weird to say, particularly like thoughtful about where this brings us. They were obviously being thoughtful about taking care of people. Yeah, was, um, everything was right where, there. Exactly. Yeah. At a time where people need to be taken care of. But, but we haven't seen them, I think, since 2019, really have a plan other than responding to what is happening. Um, and you know, you mentioned 2019, and I got a little bit of uh, PTSD, because in 2019, we had caucus members who were doing the same kind of thing, who were yep. talking to journalists yep. instead of talking to us. Um, but what I think Jigmeet did really well at the time is he went away, figured out who he was going to be as leader. He figured out what he wanted to say. And we lost seats in that election, but we went from, you know, we weren't going to keep any seats to keeping 24. So I think if the prime minister wants to stay here, um, and, and maybe he, there is no path for liberal MPs to get rid of it, but if he wants to have the liberal government survive the a few MPs after the next election, he needs to do the exact same thing. Yeah, look, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the, the, the dissident crowd is going to do. I've given an invitation to the ones that I know to come mm -hmm. on and explain themselves. Uh, so far, most of them have declined. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that next week. We're out of time. Fred Delory, <laughs> Greg McKecker, Melanie Richet, mm -hmm. always appreciate it. Thanks for being here each and every Friday. Uh,